just like that with a little bit of wiring, we've made it a whole lot easier to keep the car out of a ditch. Hey guys, you remember this car? Well, today we're going to bring it into the shop and install some upgrades. Alright guys, so if you don't remember this car, this is the 1962 Fiat 118G that we uh, originally built in 2005. My dad and some friends actually pulled this car out of a uh, local junkyard and uh, it was in the line to get crushed and uh, they saved it and it is uh, one of 300 with a removable hard top and uh, originally it was built with a small block Chevy under the hood and uh, we recently put a uh, turbo Vortec 4200 into the car and we did this as sort of a uh, proof of concept and uh, we wanted to show you guys that um, just because these engines are on the uh, larger side, <laughs> you can still fit them into a smaller chassis like the one you see here. As you can see, it is a pretty snug fit. Um, you know, <laughs> the last cylinder there is uh, actually underneath of the dash. And being that this is such a small chassis, we really didn't need to uh, put such a big turbo on this car. Um, this is actually one of the smaller sized turbos that we have run on this engine. It's a 6262. Just to give you a full rundown on what we have here, it is a 2003 Vortec 4200. That is basically completely stock. We built a custom turbo manifold off of the factory cast manifold. We're also running the factory intake manifold. The nice thing about this car is there is a fair amount of room forward to back, so it's actually not too bad of a fit. We were able to get an air-to-air -air intercooler in the car, as well as a decent-sized radiator. And the reason that um, the car is at the house today is that the new owner actually wants us to install a gold box ECU onto the car. Um, just because the original setup on the car was a piggyback setup. Now, let me uh, briefly talk about that as well. We originally set up this car with a micro squirt on top of a factory P10 ECU. And basically how that worked is that the P10 ECU would control the electronic throttle and the variable valve timing, while the micro squirt ECU would control the ignition timing as well as the fuel injectors. This setup worked uh, okay, um, but having sequential ignition and fuel um, really is preferred uh, when you're trying to make a car uh, start nice and run well. You can actually pick up uh, a little bit of horsepower just by being able to change the injection timing and that sort of thing. Also having to communicate with two different boxes whenever you want to uh, make a change to the ECU is a little bit frustrating and the factory ECU was obviously not designed with any boost in mind. So um, a lot of the VVT operation was a little bit compromised, but the, um, <laughs> the turbo is so small on this that having the low boost and high boost response with the variable valve timing really, really didn't make much of a difference just because you know, you, you don't have much turbo to spool, so uh, whether it spools off in 100 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds, um, <laughs> you know, doesn't really make that much of a difference. Now, the new owner has made a few updates to the car. He's installed a uh, very nice set of RC Comp wheels onto the car. And this car was originally built actually with uh, some Nova front spindles. Um, they're off like a 68 to 72 Nova. And um, my dad actually grafted the ball joints into the factory control arms in the front suspension. And uh, because of that, he could buy a factory brake upgrade kit for a Nova and bolt it onto the car. 
This is uh, definitely a very nice kit. I'm sure it shaved a ton of weight off of the front end. I'm uh, pretty stoked that the car is being treated so, uh, so well in its new life. <laughs> All right, guys, we uh, just brought the Fiat back into the garage. As many of you know, we actually sold this guy and the new owner wanted us to install some ECU upgrades into the car. You can see we got a mega square gold box there hiding underneath the seat. I just got done wiring it and had a little bit of fun. I, I just wanted to uh, pull this thing into the garage and go get some lunch, but of course the thing decided to fight me. I, uh, you know, had just fired up the car for the first time. It was running great. Shut it off and then went to go turn it back on and I hear a fuel pump relay click and no fuel pump. So come to find out, fuel pump decided to take a crap on me. So I figured, oh, I'll just push the thing into the garage. Well, this little slope here basically made that impossible. I couldn't push the thing up in myself. So I had to uh, uh, get to work replacing the fuel pump. Luckily, I had one on hand. Of course, the thing decided to fight me royally. And uh, <laughs> turns out the uh, new fuel pump had a different eyelet, so I had to switch all that over. Um, and I just, you know, I had a question for uh, everybody out there. Um, I was just wondering, um, how many gallons of fuel do I need to get into the armpit of this shirt before it's considered broken in? You guys tell me, leave a comment. And this was where I was really hoping that our dramas with this car would end. Unfortunately, it had a bad VVT sprocket, the starter was bad, the cooling fan died on me, the dash started to give me random issues, and I also found a software bug in the Mega Squirt Gold Box. So needless to say, this project was a little bit of a nightmare. And the reason that I'm even sharing this with all of you is just to remind you that these are hot rods. Sometimes they fight. What does new stand for? Never ever worked. Just because you put a brand new shiny part onto your build doesn't mean it is going to work even for five minutes. So we just had to fight through this and I want to encourage you guys to do the same on your projects. Next, we're gonna move on to the traction control. All right, since we're setting up traction control on this car, I wanted to kind of show you guys how we uh, sort of handle that on uh, the front wheel speed sensor. The drive shaft speed sensors are usually pretty straightforward. You can buy those uh, clamp on uh, tone ring uh, setups, but for the front, um, a lot of times what we like to do is we actually like to uh, take just a regular old Hall Effect sensor, like a Cherry sensor, and just point it at the back of the lugs. On this car that's not really possible, but it has these bolts that bolt the, uh, the rotor onto the hub. And basically I just took this bolt out here and I'm going to uh, basically use this uh, bracket here that holds the uh, caliper on and I'm going to uh, use that to mount my cherry sensor so I'm going to rotate this around and line this up with where I want it to land on the bracket it's going to be down here somewhere and then I'll get a transfer punch stick it in there and mark my punch mark and then I'll take this hub off and I will uh, drill it out and tap it, and we will have a front wheel speed sensor. Now, if you guys have never uh, used a set of transfer punches and you don't own a set, you should definitely buy something like this. Uh, basically, it's a bunch of center punches that come in all different diameters, and what you do with them is you can stick them into various holes, and basically it lines up on the ID of the hole and makes it so that it is makes a perfectly centered transfer into um, the material below. So they are very, very nifty, especially for uh, custom stuff like this. And uh, that's the size that we're gonna go with on this guy. So now I can take my hammer which is right here. 
and I can go like this and one for good luck and basically what that did is it marked the material below which you probably won't be able to see um, but if I rotate this you can see right there we have a center punch mark and now I can drill out the bracket once I get this hub out of the way and uh, we will be good to go. Alright, so now that the hub is off of the car, you can see our nice center mark right here. So now I can get my drill and I can drill that out. Now these Cherry uh, Hall Effect sensors, they are set up with a M12 by 1.0 um, thread pattern. So I got my M12 by 1.0 tap and uh, we basically have to pilot drill this for a uh, 7 16 and then our 12 millimeter will thread right in there now threading this bracket is sort of optional um, you can just use um, you know the two nuts here and just drill this out uh, to the final diameter you know the 12 millimeter if you want um, but I like to actually thread the bracket that the um, the, the sensor goes into because it's easier to adjust so let's get that done All right, we got our cherry sensor installed, and if we look in between, we can see that the sensor is lined up with the bolts there. And basically how this sensor works is you need to give it uh, five volts and sensor ground, and it will ground out the signal wire anytime you wave uh, ferrous metal, meaning magnetic metal, in front of the sensor. So what's neat about these sensors is they recommend an air gap of one millimeter. So in order to set that up, we will put one of our bolts in front of the sensor. And what's neat is uh, since this is an M12 by 1.0 thread, that means that every turn is a one millimeter change in distance. So we basically turn the sensor until it hits the bolt and then we screw it out one whole turn and that will give us an air gap of one millimeter. And uh, you know, that's a good starting point. You may find that you have to bring it a little closer sometimes, but uh, we'll start here and uh, see how it looks on the computer. And if you guys aren't using these uh, fancy Deutsch connectors for uh, your wheel speed sensor connections, you need to go get yourself a setup head over to monkey fab garage and get yourself a deutsch connector setup he sells some uh, really nice kits and uh, they are definitely some of the most affordable on the market now before you throw this thing all back together it's always a good idea to double check that the uh, wheel speed sensor is actually working so i'm just going to spin this guy over and Hopefully, we will see some wheel speed on VSS2, I believe. Yep, there it is. Works like a charm. Another neat feature of the traction control on the Gold Box is you can actually wire in a couple of uh, additional inputs and outputs, which make the whole system a lot easier to understand and tune on the fly. So what we have here is the master on off switch for the traction control. Basically this is wired into an input on the gold box and it basically just turns the entire system on or off. Next we have a traction control active LED. 
And basically what this LED tells you is uh, if this LED illuminates, it means that the system has detected slip and it is trying to uh, reduce engine horsepower in order to get that slip under control. Last, we have our target slip potentiometer, and basically how this works is you can turn this knob uh, either way, and you can tune in the targeted slip percentage. Normally, we shoot for around 5% with this system. You don't want to go too tight, so uh, I have a range of 3 to 20% on this particular knob. Next, let's move on to a data log of how this system actually works in practice. Now, before we get into the data log, I'd like to show you a video clip of the traction control in action. You're going to see the car sort of moving around, and that's because it's, it's slipping. That being said, the traction control is keeping everything under control. Like I mentioned earlier, that LED on the dash is turned on anytime it is trying to reduce engine power, and it does that by pulling ignition timing. And just like that, with a little bit of wiring, we've made it a whole lot easier to keep the car out of a ditch. Unfortunately, the data from the video that I just showed didn't actually uh, record on my computer, but this is another run that I did uh, on the previous day, and this will sort of show you how the system works. So down here in the bottom plot, we have the uh, wheel speeds plotted. The rear wheel speed is in white, and the front wheel speed is in red. So you can see that before I get into the throttle, the wheel speeds are uh, pretty even. And then as soon as I hit the throttle up here in green, that is my throttle position sensor, um, you can see that the car makes boost. And very quickly, the white line, which is the rear wheel speed, gets uh, a little bit out of control. Now how this traction control works is it basically detects when the rear wheel speed is greater than the front wheel speed, and it will basically pull timing in proportion to that, and also there is a time component to that as well. So as you can see here, we get this TC slip versus time uh, value here that begins to increase. And then also we get a green uh, spark ignition retard. And um, you can see that it is pulling ignition timing and it gets this white rear wheel speed to uh, you know sort of level out and it catches the front wheel speed up to the rear wheel speed and gets the thing back gripped up. This is a great feature, but it doesn't work for every car. If you are pulling the front wheels in like a, a drag race scenario, obviously you are not going to have reliable front wheel data. So uh, it has its place, but um, it's definitely great for street cars where you just want to do uh, some street stuff. And, um, you know, it does work pretty well in some racing applications. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Um, this car is going to be headed off back to its new owner, and I hope that it provides them a long life of lots of smiles per gallon. We gotta say goodbye to this thing again. So I hope you enjoyed today's video, and hopefully you learned something. Uh, make sure that you like, subscribe, consider buying a t-shirt, and we will see you in the next one.